Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I have been in a state of panic for about 20 minutes. We can tell. Yes, you can tell. Well, uh, the guy texted me and said, I won't be here today. So I get to film and I started to film, but for 20 minutes I could not get my phone to operate the camera. And I'm like, ah! Oh. And just solved it within three minutes ago. So now it's working, but in the meantime, I worked on that camera getting it centered, and uh, in my panic and pushing buttons and everything, now it's off center. <laughs> so, you know, it's it still is pointed this way, but it's not perfect. So this is another one of those learning lessons for me about it doesn't have to be perfect. The Lord will take care of it. So again, this is where I'm at. So I prayed this morning and asked God just to calm me down and then and then it went out that way. You weren't listening, were you? I was trying. <laughs> All right, so now let me officially start after that confession. We're entering the final stages of our Lord's journey on earth. And I as I was thinking about that, because we're right at the very end of Matthew, what we've been studying, and as of next week, we'll wrap up our study in Matthew. And I thought, for what we'll look at today, it's fitting to listen to Isaiah's historic prophecy. And this is what he wrote 700 or more years before this dark time in our Lord's life. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave, but it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier. 
because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. Who was to blame for all that he suffered? Us. That's it. It was us. We were the cause. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as I come before you right now, we have heard your words this morning. Isaiah wrote so long ago, and these words were fulfilled in the ordeal that your son experienced for all of us. And we understand and realize that without death, there can be no forgiveness for sins. So we realize that his death was instrumental in our being forgiven by you. How we are humble and how appreciative we are that he went through all of this to secure for us forgiveness and eternal life. And we are eternally grateful. We pray this all in Jesus' name. All right, so the first hymn we're going to sing, I thought would be good to focus on what we just read. So it's hymn number 327. And we're going to sing the first, third, and fourth verse of number 327. And it's probably a very familiar hymn to many of you. So hopefully the words will be just as beautiful. So you find your place, join me in standing. First, third, and fourth.
First of all, if you notice at the top there, it's called the Center for Bible Engagement. And what that is is that the producers of our daily bread that many of you enjoy and pick up in the hallway there, they contacted me. They contacted me by email. They contacted me by phone. And so I talked with them. And they wanted us as a group to participate in a pilot program that they're trying out with a group of churches with the hope of rolling the program out full speed ahead in 2025. So I thought about it a lot, considered what they were saying, and I consented. So I consented for all of us. <laughs> and that means all of us must participate. It's a church program, all right? Now you're probably thinking, okay, what do I have to do? All right, there at the table where you pick up your handouts is one of these, okay, by itself. And what it is, is it's your access to a survey that they want you to take. And I was promised it's not a survey that's going to take it out, okay? But anyways, there's the form. It's on the back, okay? There's two ways of accessing it. You can scan this with your phone, smartphone. Or there's an actual link you can type in at the bottom underneath it to access it, okay? And so you have until August 30th to do this survey. And so my thought is it would be great if we got at least 30 or between 30 and 40 replies for this, all right? And so that would mean, hey, youth, teens, do the survey too, all right? As many as we can do, let's do it. And then from there, after August 30th, then they will come to me with another step in the program that I should follow through on. But this is the first step. Okay, and it's by our daily bread are the producers of it. So if you're taking advantage of their materials, then you should participate, okay? That's what they're asking us to do. So please participate. That'll be my last announcement. If we run out of these forms and you need one, let me know and I'll make a copy. All right, then the second announcement there, Right Now Media, I was looking through them this week and I came on this program called The Israel Story. And I started watching it and I couldn't stop watching it. It's that good. It's, I haven't finished watching it, but I am planning today to watch more episodes this afternoon. And you might say, well, what is it about? It is a Jewish Christian teaching, and he's teaching the whole Bible as to how Israel is being used of God throughout the whole Bible, from the Old Testament through to the New Testament. And then when he gets done, he's even going to look at present day situations involving Israel. And his teaching is phenomenal. And I watched that just amazed. And he has a, the, the setting is a place where he's teaching a group of 20-somethings. And it's a very relaxed setting. And his interaction with them is conversational as he's teaching the Bible and showing God's plan for Israel, starting from the very beginning in Genesis and stretching throughout the whole Bible through the New Testament also. So I would encourage you, watch this. You will not be disappointed. You will gain much from seeing this. Much about God's plan for all of us. It's that good. Okay? The Israel story. Be sure, check it out, and watch it. And my understanding is the whole teaching session was probably a day to do this. And so what they've done is they've broken up each period of about 25 minutes. So they'll, they'll do a segment, and then if you keep watching, it'll go right into the next segment. And actually, his teaching is going the whole day long, okay? But they've broken it up into pieces. So if you watch a couple pieces and you got to stop, you can stop and go back and pick up where you left off, okay? But it is very good. You will be 
you will learn something great about our God. Okay, so next. Denise, would you like to share the news about your husband? Sure. Okay, why don't you come right up here? We want everybody to hear you and the people that are getting the recording, like the vid audio, that's so they can hear you too. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. So most of you know that Duane has been battling with a muscle disorder. Well, it's come to the conclusion, we went to his spinal muscle doctor, and his doctor has become aware of a medicine that he has been on since 2015, and it causes muscle deterioration and weakness. So he has taken him off of it, and Dwayne is now without his cane. So he's gonna to continue, hopefully, to get better. You know, I'm not sure I believe that. Would you stand up? <laughs> what do you think? Isn't it God good? It only takes one doctor to come to a different conclusion that works. Praise God for that. Okay, got a couple prayer requests I want to mention to you. Uh, if you have your announcements and you flip it over, you'll see a prayer request concerning Mackenzie, great-granddaughter of Fran Daly. I think it's about 11, 12, or a number there. Um, we had called around for a prayer request concerning her a few days ago, and the medical problem she's dealing with is not resolved, okay? So it's still unresolved as of what you see on your prayer list. So we would ask that you would continue to pray for her, and it has to do with her medical port it is the whole focus of the problem, okay? So be in prayer. That's an ongoing situation that has not been resolved. Then a second request, and that is, that's not on your list, is uh, Doug Hendrickson called me and uh, shared with me that his cousin, Daniel Milroy, how many of you remember, he came and spoke for me about three years ago. Anybody remember that? He was here and spoke. He's a pastor up in Albion, and he's retired now from pastoring. And just a very good, godly man. I've enjoyed getting to know him a little bit. Uh, well, he's been diagnosed with leukemia. He is now in the hospital, and he'll be in the hospital for 28 consecutive days. So I would ask that you pray for him and his family through this situation because I'm sure the prayers will help and God will work through them. So I think that's all the announcements I have. So let's go to the Lord in prayer for the needs that are before us. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your blessings and your kindnesses to us. For all the answers to prayer we have witnessed here. Uh, we think about uh, Dwayne Madison and what's happening in his life and how we pray for him through all the the difficulties he was experiencing as of the last few years. And what a blessing it is to see what seemed like a irrevocable diagnosis now being reversed and things turning around. And we know that you're doing, that's your hand, and we give you praise, glory, and honor because you're the God that can do what's impossible. And so we praise you for what's happening in his life physically and also spiritually. And then we also pray, Lord, right now for Mackenzie. We know the family is greatly concerned as she continues in this critical situation. We would pray for the medical staff and team as they look for ways to resolve the issue at hand. And we would pray that you would bring about a solution, one that will work in her physical condition. Thank you for sustaining her through all the years of her life and even reaching the age of 17. We pray now your blessing on that situation with her. And then we think of Daniel Milroy. We sure do appreciate his love for you and his faithfulness and pastoring and the ways that he has helped others. And now he's in need of help. We would pray that you would 
Give strength to him in this hour of need. Continue to strengthen his faith. Help him and his family through this crisis. We pray also that you would intervene physically and help with the medical treatment. Thank you for what you're going to accomplish. We rest in you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, for our greeting him, let's go to number 329. And we are just going to sing one verse of 329, okay? So join me in number 329. We'll just sing the first verse, and then we'll greet one another. All right? So join me and stand.
did not comprehend the moment they participated in. If they had, then they wouldn't have done what they did to Jesus. The next comments involve the members of the first church located in Jerusalem in a combined prayer. O oh Lord, creator of heaven and earth and of the sea and everything in them, you spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor, King David, your servant, saying, why do the heathen rage against the Lord? And the foolish nations plan their little plots against Almighty God. The kings of the earth unite to fight against him and against the anointed Son of God. That is what is happening here in this city today for Herod the king and Pontius Pilate the governor and all the Romans as well as the people of Israel are united against Jesus. Your anointed son, your holy servant, they won't stop at anything that you and your wise power will let them do. So the opposition against Jesus is strong and vicious. This alliance of evil is like a flood of force which only God can control. If given a free hand, they will act without restraint in the worst manner. Our next comments come from John the Apostle, written long after the events we will examine today. Before anything else existed, there was Christ with God. He has always been alive and is himself God. He created everything there is. Nothing exists that he didn't make. Eternal life is in him. And this life gives light to all mankind. His life is the light that shines through the darkness. And the darkness can never extinguish it. The darkness of mankind try to extinguish the light of God meant for our good. But the darkness involving great evil could not overcome the light, even though they believed they could. And then John adds a final comment. But although he made the world, the world didn't recognize him when he came. Even in his own land and among his own people, the Jews, he was not accepted. Only a few would welcome and receive him. Gentiles involved in this dark effort didn't know him. Jews involved in this dark effort acted willfully in rejecting him. Only a minority would yield to the truth in this terrible time. So now I would say, let's begin our journey into the dark with Jesus. So open your Bibles to Matthew 27. Matthew 27. I'm going to start at verse 26 and read through verse 31 to begin with. Matthew 27, verse 26. Then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. In this description, we have the dark actions of a Roman governor ordering the prisoner to be flogged. This had become a cruel measure to bring someone to the point of death without crossing. Get it as close as possible to that line. This involved extreme blood loss and could bring on shock to your system. 
Now, after this horrible experience, Jesus is delivered into the hands of hardened Roman soldiers, accustomed to showing no mercy to others. Quite possibly being denied the opportunity to take out their vengeance on Barabbas has increased their desire to behave worse with Jesus. Everyone present, possibly numbering as many as 200, join in this dark game of cruel mockery. All the courtesy extended to a true king is twisted to show complete disdain. Everything they can think of to show their disdain to a king is now practiced here. The size of the group adds to the intensity of their actions in trying to outdo each other in depravity, meaning how low can you go? And every single person wants to go lower than the one that came before him. 200. When they finish with him, then he now resembles Isaiah's prediction from long ago. They shall see my servant beaten and bloody, so disfigured, one would scarcely know it was a person standing there. So shall he cleanse many nations. The ordeal only gets worse after this experience. How? Look at verse 32. Now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. Condemned prisoners were forced to carry the heavy crossbeam on a torturous journey covering 600 yards that wound through the city. This was the Roman way of showing crime does not pay. They hoped such a display would scare potential lawbreakers from any criminal activity. As we can understand, Jesus was so weakened by his ordeal that he fell under the weight of the beam. So Simon, a visitor to the Passover feast, is drafted to carry the beam while Jesus comes the remainder of the way, and I would say, somehow. Somehow. The arrival at the destination adds to his humiliation. And again, we ask, how? Let's go from verses 33 through 38. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there. And they put up over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. So, he's offered drugged wine to lessen the pain in his body, but he will not yield to that mind-altering substance. With his mind intact, he witnesses his final possessions being claimed as prizes in games of chance as these soldiers blindly fulfill scriptural predictions. Now they sit and begin what they think will be a drawn out process to the end, indifferent of his suffering. His crime is on full display above his head for all to read as a joke intended to taunt the Jewish leadership by the Roman governor. Adding insult to injury is the presence of two criminals 
being executed by his side. And their execution wasn't for robbery alone. It was more than that, meaning they were likely the partners of Barabbas in evil. Their leader got away, but they didn't. The king of righteousness is being portrayed as the opposite by this circumstance. The place of execution is in full view of the heavily traveled road leading into the city with many travelers passing by. Now folks, we want to hide our most embarrassing moments. But that doesn't happen for Jesus. The darkness will continue to increase as a result of this. Again, how? Look at verse 39 and 40. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So as we can see, the twisting of his words are used to blaspheme him in the most cruel manner. He is taunted in numerous ways by those coming to Jerusalem to participate in the Passover. Would we ever be tempted to act sinfully in our journey to come worship the Lord here like this? I would say sadly, it can happen to us. The opposition, which wanted him executed, just can't stop gloating over his demise. Look at verses 41 through 43. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking with the scribes and elders said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. It seems whatever Jesus said or whatever Jesus did is now fuel for them to taunt him with. These men believe in kicking their opponent when he is down to the lowest point. Can there be anything worse than the dark displays of these two groups? And I would say, sadly, yes. Well, what is it? Look at verse 44. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Did you catch this? Matthew uses the word even to describe the cruel comments of the criminals who are being executed with him. These men lacking any respectability chime in to increase the darkness. I would say this cruel behavior lasted for not just one hour, not just two hours, probably three hours three hours. It's hard to tolerate such conduct for minutes, let alone hours. This is how dark mankind can grow from the evil in their hearts. But the circumstance will become even darker. And again, how? Look at verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, 
until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. What is happening here? Well, this is the darkness of the sin of mankind descending upon Jesus as the sin bearer of the world. This isn't an eclipse of the sun. It isn't a rainstorm. It is a supernatural display of our sin and God's wrath being poured out on our sin. That's what's being pictured here. This is the visualization of hell on earth. That's what you're witnessing. You see, hell is the absence of light. That's what we're witnessing. Jesus is facing God in heaven as any sinner will when they depart this earth. This is what it's like. He is experiencing God's wrath in full force. This is what's happening. This circumstance silenced all the derision being expressed against him. No one is saying much as they're affected by this display. How is it that they're affected so severely? Listen. God said to Moses in Egypt, stretch out your hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt. Darkness which may even be felt. If that darkness could be felt, then imagine what the direct darkness surrounding Jesus felt like. What it felt like. The silence of those present tells us all we need to know. If it is silent for three hours and all you can hear are people breathing, no one's talking. They're just breathing. Then who will break the silence? Look at verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is another indication of the judgment of God upon sin and the sinner in hell. All who depart this world in unbelief, folks, are separated from God. This is what Jesus endures for us in taking all of our sin upon himself. Being isolated on earth puts a terrible strain on anyone to continue living. I think in some examples, it drives people to suicide. Being totally isolated with no remedy for it is the experience of being in hell for a sinner. This is why nations at war will sometimes put prisoners of war in solitary confinement to drive them mad. Jesus knew this type of suffering as a result of our sin. Our sin. He knew the terrible physical pain. He knew the terrible spiritual pain in being separated from God with the absence of all light. When he broke his silence, so did the others watching him. And how did they break their silence? Look at verses 47 through 49. Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine, 
put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. Those who know not God never understand the truth and have a habit of twisting whatever they hear. Instead of realizing he's quoting from Psalm 22, they think Elijah has been summoned. The drugged wine continues to be pushed at him, while others are intent to look for Elijah, showing him. What a totally misdirected group of onlookers these people are. The end is coming, and they are completely unaware. Look at verse 15. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Amen. Here's the fulfillment of his prediction recorded by John the Apostle. Listen, Jesus said this. No one can kill me without my consent. I lay down my life voluntarily, for I have the right and the power to lay it down when I want to, and also the right and power to take it again, for the Father has given me this these executioners thought they held the power of death over him, as did his Jewish opponents. But that power would never be relinquished by him to them. He knew when he would exercise this power to their utter astonishment. But he wasn't the only one acting in this terrible time outside the realm of human control. Another powerful witness chose to act too. You might say, who? Look at verse 51. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. This veil was a very heavy curtain, extremely high, as in 60 feet, and at least 30 feet wide, with a thickness we have never seen before. Tearing it was humanly impossible. It symbolized the separation of man from the holy God. But God in heaven tore the curtain open from top to bottom to reveal what? All the old ways requiring priests to represent us and sacrifices to make us presentable to God were over. We're over. None of these things are needed to to the sacrifice of God's Son. This is God's doing. Listen to this wonderful explanation. Dear brothers, now we may walk right into the very holy of holies where God is because of the blood of Jesus. This is the fresh, new, life-giving way that Christ has opened up for us by tearing the curtain, his human body, to let us in to the holy presence of God. And since this great high priest of ours rules over God's household, let us go right in to God himself with true hearts, fully trusting him to receive us. <clears throat> because we have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. And because our bodies have been washed with pure water. Folks, this is God's testimony based upon the work of his son on the cross. And it's marvelous. Not only that, look at verse 51. And the earth quaked 
and the rocks were split in giving of God's law to Moses and the Israelites the mountain shook furiously indicating the demands of the law would be binding on all people it would show us God's standard of perfection and require death for every violation of that standard but now death of Jesus has fulfilled all the demands of the law for all time for all who belong to God. This is the earth shaking truth testified by God. It's a moment in time as sacred as the giving of the law. Listen to this wonderful description of this moment. When you came to Christ, he set you free from your evil desires not by a bodily operation of circumcision, but a spiritual operation, the baptism of your souls. For in baptism, you see how your old evil nature died with him and was buried with him. Then you came up out of death with him into a new life because you trusted the word of the mighty God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead in sins. And your sinful desires were not yet cut away. Then he gave you a share in the very life of Christ. For he forgave all your sins and blotted out the charges against you. The list of his commandments which you had not obeyed. He took this list of sins and destroyed it by nailing it to Christ's cross. In this way, God took away Satan's power to accuse you of sin. And God openly displayed to the whole world Christ's triumph at the cross where your sins are all taken away. Amen. Hallelujah! Amen. Amen! This is victory for us. This is our glory and our praise. Hallelujah! John the baptizer said, Jesus is the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. And folks, we know this for a fact. Look at verse 52 and 53. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Oh, this is amazing. Somewhere around Jerusalem was a cemetery housing the bodies of righteous people. And it seemed the grave and death were victorious over God's people at that time. But God's message is that the reign of these two is coming to an end. However many were included in this miracle, gave witness to this fact after the resurrection of Jesus was accomplished when they joined him in that moment. Listen to Paul's famous saying about resurrection. When this happens, then at last this scripture will come true. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where then your victory? Where then your sting? For sin, the sting that causes death, will all be gone. And the law, which reveals our sins, will no longer be our judge. How we thank God for all of this. It is he who makes us victorious through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, God in heaven was busy pointing to the truth which his son fulfilled. He was pointing, he was pointing, he was saying, look, look, look. Another fitting comment on this dark moment in the life of Jesus comes from Paul. Here's what he said. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. To those who are the call according to his purpose. You know, as we can see, 
all that happened here wasn't dark. It wasn't. And again, you got to say, well, like what? Look at verse 54. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Hey, the Roman commander and his group of soldiers present, they did not stay the same. They knew, they witnessed something that was not natural. And they rightfully attribute it to who? To Jesus. To Jesus. This group discovered the truth as a result of God's testimony to them when they weren't looking for him. This is a visual example of a story that Jesus told during his ministry about Gentiles. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure a man discovered in a field. In his excitement, he sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field and get the treasure to. That's what this commander and his soldiers are doing. They just stumbled into treasure. Where? At the cross. What other good came from this dark moment? Look at verse 55 and 56. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, were there looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Here's something wonderful. You ready? These women wouldn't abandon Jesus. Even when the twelve deserted him, you know who stuck by him? It was the women. The women wouldn't leave. They wouldn't give up. They wouldn't forsake him. They supported him in doing ministry, and they stayed right to the very end. It seems that Matthew points out three from the larger group of women from Galilee for special recognition. And you might say, why? Let's start with Mary Magdalene. You know what's special about her? Jesus delivered her from demonic possession. That's her claim to fame. I was controlled by the enemy, and my Lord saved me. Then you've got Mary, who is the mother of James, and her son James happens to be one of the group of twelve. She's the mother of a disciple. She's here at the cross, sad to say, and her son isn't. The mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, is named Salome. I wonder if Salome, in this moment, regrets her earliest suggestion made to Jesus about her two sons. You remember it? She said to him, Grant that these, my two sons, may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left, in your kingdom. I wonder what she thinks now standing there looking at the cross of Jesus. According to John, her son, these three women are standing with the mother of Jesus at the cross. And John is standing there too. Paul wrote a meaningful comment which applies to all the women from Galilee present. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they are good for us. They help us learn to be patient and patience develops strength of character in us and helps us trust God more each time we use it until finally our hope and faith are strong and steady. 
You see, the good coming from this dark time just keeps surfacing. As Matthew writes, it just keeps coming out. There's light in the darkness, and it's showing up. It's there. It's there. Look at this final group of verses, 57 through 61. Now when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And notice, and Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. What's remarkable about this final act on this dark day? I think it is the reporting of John the apostle about men like Joseph. Here's what he reported. He said, even many of the Jewish leaders believed him to be the Messiah, but wouldn't admit it to anyone because of their fear that the Pharisees would excommunicate them from the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. This man may have been a disciple, but it was a strongly held secret until this moment. This dark day caused him to come out into the open. Instead of remaining under cover. Now, his tomb was not in his hometown. This would be highly unusual because they strongly held to their ancestral lands and were always buried in those places. This tomb was located right next to an execution spot. No one would want to be associated with such a location for their remains. So what is going on? I think he acted in faith, preparing this tomb from his wealth for this moment. Now his preparation is complete to house the body of his Lord. I think he was the only one who could have secured the body for burial due to his position as a leader in the Jewish government. Of course, we can't overlook two women named Mary watching to see how the body is prepared for burial. Their loyalty takes them right to the very end. And now, one of the darkest days in the history of mankind has ended. And everyone is left to mull over these events privately while trying to make sense of it all. And sadly, the prevailing opinion among the followers of Jesus is spoken by one of the Marys, who's the mother of a disciple, spoken by her husband named Cleopas, and he told a stranger that happened to be Jesus in person, that Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem What did he miss? What did they miss? John writes much later the answer connected to the plot against Jesus. This prophecy 
that Jesus should die for the entire nation came from Caiaphas in his position as high priest. He didn't think of it by himself, but was inspired to say it. It was a prediction that Jesus' death would not be for Israel only, but for all the children of God scattered around the world. His death was to redeem all the children of God in all the world, not in Israel only. And this was the only way to accomplish it. That's what I say. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we come before you right now, we just want to thank you for this account as written by your faithful servant, Matthew. And how much he put into writing this account to honor the Lord Jesus Christ, your son, and to honor you, his father. And here in what we've read and studied and learned, we are humbled that you and your son would go to this length to save us and forgive us and give us eternal life. Wow. I just cannot express my gratitude in a way that would be <coughs> acceptable to you. I'm just, just awed at this great description of this terrible experience that accomplished so much. We are so thankful today to be born again, to be part of your kingdom. What a wonderful kingdom it is, and what a wonderful father you are, and what a wonderful savior your son is. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I think I'm just going to do something real simple as we close. Uh, let's just sing Amazing Grace. I think it's 343. Just one verse of amazing grace to join me in singing. Just one verse of amazing grace.